Kaina Koto Kotoa. The Commission's business this afternoon starts with the submission of Waimakariri Next Generation Farmers Trust. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Mark Christensen. I'm representing the Waimakariri Next Generation Farmers Trust. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. Um, could I start, perhaps, sir, with just checking that the commissioners, you all have the, the, all the right documents and evidence? Uh, yes, by the, all means. We should the, do that. The trust lodged a submission and a further submission. Yes, uh, we have and, and then we have uh, six witnesses to present today. Those witnesses are Mr Sam Spencer-Bauer, and he, yes, also had, he also has a summary of his evidence which was filed. Yes. Um, we have Mr. Jonathan Austin as, a, as witness. Um, oh, who's this? Say again. Mr. Jonathan Austin. Oh, Austin. Yes. And has, has he lodged? Have you lodged evidence? For yes, him? yes, sir. There's a <clears throat> statement of a short statement of evidence from Mr. Austin. Uh, there's no summary. Uh, it's just the uh, just the evidence from Mr. Austin. Now. Uh, it may. It was originally filed uh, on the website, at least uh, under another uh, under his his own personal submission. But he is presenting evidence for on behalf of the trust. I I I think um, the hearing administrators may have. I understood that forwarded you a note to say that that um, that evidence has been circulated. Where that evidence was on behalf of the trust. Well, they certainly sent a message to that effect. That doesn't mean to say I was able to find it. Uh, so anyway, yes. you, you, so, you've, so got, you've got to hit Mr. Austin. Mr. He's going to give evidence. Yes, Mr. Austin. Uh, on behalf of this submitter, is that right? Yes, that's correct, sir. Yes. Uh, and then um, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Clark, Dave and Rosemary Clark. Uh, now. Mr. Clark has fallen ill today, uh, so Mrs. Clark is here, but also um, their daughter-in-law, uh, Ms. Hazel Clark, will be actually presenting that evidence. It's really expressed as a f as a family uh, statement of evidence, sir. So that's uh, uh, the Clarks. Uh, then Mr. Richard Stalker. Yes, well, I have Mr. Stalker's evidence. Yes. Yes. And then, no. no. No problem with that. Right, and then Ms. Victoria Trainer. It's also in the same category as having originally been put on the website under Aratika Trust. It's her family farm, but uh, she is providing the evidence. Well, we, have, we have Aratika Trust coming tomorrow. Yes. And, uh, They've lodged a submission, yes. though I didn't know that they'd lodged any evidence. Uh, no, uh, they haven't, sir. Um, as I understand it, uh, the uh, the owner of the property at Arataki Trust will be presenting or speaking to that submission tomorrow. That's, yes, separ that's separate to, to the evidence. That's separate to the evidence that Ms. Train has provided uh, on behalf of the trust. Uh, and then finally, uh, Ms. Sue Rustin has a statement of evidence uh, that's planning expert evidence. Yes, well, there's no problem about that. We have that, and uh, certainly uh, I've read it, and I'm sure my colleagues will have too. <clears throat> and then and we also have some uh, legal submissions yes, sir. Uh, that I think you might have prepared, Mr Christensen. I have, sir. Those have been filed. Um, there, there were two, uh, two additional statements of evidence that were filed originally uh, on behalf of the Trust, and that was from um, Mr Dan Ensel and Mr Richard Norchi, and both of those gentlemen are no longer available to present, sir, so that, that evidence won't be presented. Yes, well... So I, I got the message that they were coming, so I didn't read their statements. Yes. So that's all of the, um, the documents that we have, sir. Thank you, Mr. Christensen. It's a very good start. Sir, so, uh, um, I don't intend um, to read my submissions. You've, I understand you will have read them. Uh, the trusts 
uh, case is really quite narrow and limited in some ways. Um, it essentially it relates to, or primarily relates to table 8-9 around the nutrient reduction loss, uh, loss targets in that table. And the essential question is whether the targets set out in that table should extend beyond 2040. So um, their position is that they should, uh, the, the 2030 and the 2040 limits uh, are appropriate, but beyond that, not at this stage. And that's, that's the essential, uh, essential issue that the Trust wants to uh, pr provide their evidence on. And, it, and the issue is around whether the, the costs of, or the risks associated with the table extending out to, in one case, on one sub-zone to 2080, outweigh the risks of it not including that data at this stage. So that's all I wanted to say in terms of opening, unless you had um, some questions here. Well, thank you, Mr. Christensen. There, there was a question that occurred that was in my mind as I was reading your submissions, uh, which I might ask you at a time, either now or later, whichever you prefer. Um, and that relates to <clears throat> a theme that you were addressing in your submissions about Caution. Yes. Would you like me to discuss that with you now, or would you rather no. be able no. to discuss that later? Now's fine, thank you, sir. Well, I'm not entirely unfamiliar with the notion of uh, caution and a precautionary approach, and uh, I, I am familiar with some cases where that's been addressed and you've referred to some of them too. But what was in my mind was that we now had a slightly different framework that we're working in, particularly the uh, NPS FM 2020. It seemed to me that some of the contents of that new NPS might qualify as strong directions in the sense that that term was used in the King Salmon case. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that maybe what's been said in other cases in previous frameworks about when precaution might be permissible and when it's not, is no longer necessarily just a cut and paste to the present circumstances because of the strong directions in the 2020 NPS. Do you think I've uh, explained the subject matter sufficiently for you to be able to think about it and? Uh, give a response, either now or when it suits you. Uh, yes, yes, thank you, sir. Um, I, 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 ex I agree that the 2020 National Policy state Statement introduces um, what could be called strong directions uh, in that King Salmon sense. Uh, and it introduces the clear direction around the prioritisation of, um, of issues with Tamana Otiwai in the lead. Uh, what I was saying um, in, in my submissions was, was really trying to address the issue of whether there was a separate additional obligation to apply a precautionary principle or a precautionary approach, approach outside of the RMA. And that's what I was focusing on in the written submissions. It's my submission that that has not changed with the introduction of the NPS. 2050, 2020, um, and it still was a matter of uh, undertaking an appropriate level of caution in accordance with um, those accepted principles given the new context that we have. So I, I don't, I don't think it changes the um, the issue around uh, whether the the RMA itself provides the full context for a cautious approach. It's my submission that it, that it does and it remains so, even with the 2020 NPS in place. Well, 
thank you, Mr. Christensen. I wonder if my colleagues, either of them, wish to ask you anything to add to the submissions <clears throat> before the evidence. To Mr. Van Voortuizen. Yes, just a couple of issues, but um, firstly, thank you for the submissions. I've found them very clear and helpful. Um, just one question. We're hearing tomorrow from a group called As One. Mm. They say they represent 90 farmers, and I think your group represents 130 farmers. Mm. What, what degree, if any, of overlap is there between the farmers? Do you know? Uh, look, there is some overlap. But could I uh, ask Mr Spencer Bauer to... You probably will know more about that. Yeah, there is... Um, quite a bit of overlap in farmers within okay. those groups. And then, Mr Christian, just a, a, <clears throat> a matter that arises at your paragraph 11, um, top of page 4, uh, where you say NGFT suggests that the plan should nevertheless make it clear, and then you have A, B and C. Mm. And then... <laughs> Looking at Ms uh, Rushton's recommended changes in her Appendix 3, I'm not sure if the additional policy that she recommends to us at the end of her Appendix 3 fully captures all of your A, B and C. Uh, look, I so, think you... So not a question for you, but yes. maybe just to invite Ms Rushton. She probably won't be on for a little while yet. She might like to think about yes. whether that recommended policy could be expanded to reflect what you suggest at your paragraph. Yes, whatever. thank you. Yes, that, I, I agree they're not uh, completely yeah. aligned, so... Um, I don't have issue with what you suggest yes. here. I just didn't think the policy captured it. Yes, thank but you. But that, that was the only question I had, thanks. Commissioner Solomon. No, I have no questions. Thank you. Very well. Thank you, Mr Christensen. So you can proceed to the evidence that you'd like to call now. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Um, so Mr Spencer Bowers first. Um, Thank you. Oh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I take it that you've read my um, a statement of evidence on the 17th of July and then a summary statement um, of evidence from the 13th of November. Thank you. Um, look, I just was going to just give you a quick introduction to myself and uh, the Next Generation Farmers Trust. And then I've just got a few key points. I've got four key points that I wanted to make, um, which are mainly coming out of the summary statement. Thank you. Yes, so, yeah, as Mark Christensen has told you, my name's Sam Spencer Bauer, and I'm uh, General Manager for our family farming business called Claxby. We're um, 1,400 hectares and milking 3,000 cows. Uh, we've got 18 full-time staff and we're located in the nitrate priority sub-area C. Um, I'm a fifth generation of the family farming there, and I'm also operations manager for Claxby Irrigation Limited, which is our um, irrigation scheme for our farms and some of our neighbours. Um, and before going back to the farm, I spent seven years as an agronomist with a plant breeding company and also I'm secretary for the Next Generation Farmers Trust or NGF as we call it. So just a little bit of intro about NGF. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a group of five trustees and we got together about two years ago. Um, there's over 130 farmer members and Look, we, re we really got together to help um, farmers in our zone understand what Plan Change 7 would mean for them and also to help assist them with making submissions because it's not something that uh, we've uh, had much experience with. So, um, But I think we did a reasonably good job of getting a good number of s submissions into you. Um, we also uh, formed an industry stakeholders group um, with our involving our industry um, representative bodies. Um, I think that was quite helpful in um, discussing the various um, possible outcomes of Plan Change 7 and, and um, what solutions and suggestions we might 
um, put into submissions. Um, and next generation farmers now is really looking to move into more of a proactive phase um, and looking to encourage farmer engagement uh, in environmental mitigations. And uh, you would have seen in my submission uh, mention of a, an MPI, Sustainable um, Food and Fibre Futures uh, funded project. So I'll touch on that a little bit uh, shortly in my, in my key points. Um, so yeah, I'll just, the four key points that I've um, taken out um, to highlight to you today are, uh, one is around uncertainty, two is around the um, targets beyond 2040 and their unintended consequences. Um, the third is just uh, achieving an understanding of uh, the achievements that farmers have made so far. And the last point was around the um, MPI project that we're part of. So just um, around the uncertainty, um, look, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, from a farmer's perspective with Plan Change 7. Um, there's uncertainty to do with the, the water quality measurements themselves. There's uncertainty to do with the, the modelling of future water quality. There's uncertainty around the appropriateness of the limits for water quality. Uncertainty around how the proposed reductions will actually affect water quality. Uh, there's uncertainty around the nitrate priority sub-areas. And there's also uncertainty about how our nutrient baselines are calculated. So, but what we're proposing moving forward is to um, hopefully engage in a, in a partnership approach to try and uh, undertake some better measuring and monitoring, something we'd like to work with Environment Canterbury on and other stakeholders in our zone to try and provide more clarity on, on all of those things. Uh, and then to touch on the targets beyond 2040 and the unintended consequences. Um, uh, we believe as NGF that um, having nitrate reduction targets beyond 2040 will create um, a barrier for farmers to uh, for further investment and also engagement in the process. Um, farmers really need some light at the end of the tunnel and if with the uh, long time frame of reductions, if they can only see a future of being non-viable, then um, there's really, it's difficult to be motivated and engaging in the process to keep making improvements. The other one is with the um, long time frames on these reductions and, and the high level of them, um, it's the effect on land value, and particularly with having um, sub-areas um, where it appears that the, uh, there's not great justification for those sub-areas. Um, and also the uncertainty of um, profitability into the future with the high reduction levels. It, it makes it difficult for farmers to see a way forward um, and to continue to invest in mitigations that are going to help our environmental footprint. Um, And I, I refer to, um, in my submission, some economic um, work that's been done by Mr Dool, Dairy NZ, um, and Mr Ford and Mr Copeland from Will. Um, just show, it really showing at what point that um, it becomes difficult for farmers to, be, to remain viable. Um, there's obviously a range uh, within that. Um, and I'd just like to make the point, uh, my third point is about understanding the achievements that have been made so far by farmers. Um, look, we understand the need to be cautious and the need to um, continually improve our farming practices um, to, to mitigate our effects on water quality. But um, I'd just like to highlight that 
farmers in the last few years have made significant improvements. Um, you know, a lot of money has been spent on infrastructure and improving systems um, to improve our environmental footprint. Um, and a good example that the Farm Environment Plan framework is it has worked really well as a vehicle for change. Um, yeah, some other submitters would pro have the view that we haven't done it, done anything or done much at all, but um, a lot has been achieved. The final point I'd like to make is just to um, highlight that NGF as a group um, uh, have, are really trying to be proactive and um, uh, help farmers be engaged in this process um, so that we can continue to improve. Um, so the, the, there's two, mate, it's a three year project, um, the Sustainable Food and Fibre Futures Fund project um, that we've had approved and have uh, recently started. Uh, the two, there's two main um, parts to it. The first is to experiment and investigate environmental mitigation options that are before farmers and um, with a focus on farmer to farmer learning. And also the other one is a whole of farm planning um, process. So we're looking to go a little bit further than just um, uh, nutrient loss. Uh, look, because there's many, many things that uh, farmers have to take into consideration and, and are potentially uh, likely to be coming at us. So for example, um, the whole of farm planning would involve uh, farmers having a plan around greenhouse gases, um, biodiversity, mahinga kai, health and safety, animal welfare, employment, biosecurity, waste minimisation and social responsibility, among other things. Yeah, those are my key points and yeah, thank you for the opportunity, thank you for listening and yeah, happy to take any questions? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Spencer Brown. That's uh, very interesting and uh, you covered it well. Co Commissioner Van Voort, is there any questions of Mr. Spencer Bauer? No, no questions, but I found your evidence very helpful, and particularly your summary statement. I thought you did a really good job of pulling together the key concerns and also indicating to where you think um, solutions might arise in terms of your, your group's interests. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan. Um, I did have one question, but actually it's been answered and uh, Mr Spencer Bauer answered that. I was going to ask him about what the funding was going to be spent on, but you've explained what it's going to be spent on, so I have no more questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I wonder if... Um, if I could come first to, to the point you've just been making, Mr. Spencer Bauer, about um, the, the advice that we've seen and you've seen from Mr. Dool and Mr. Copeland and Mr. Ford. And certainly we've uh, had the benefit of uh, their skill and experience too. I also have in mind that we had evidence earlier in the week from Mr Butcher, who's another uh, of their professional colleagues, but who had a different um, conclusion to come to and, ex and to explain, so that we are faced with an issue, as, as they call it, where there's different pieces of advice there. And I thought I should let you know that in case there's any comment you want to make in that regard. And th then I'll come to another question. Okay, yeah, sorry, I'm not aware of Mr Butcher's... You haven't seen Mr Butcher's... No, advice. but I will have a look. Have um, a look at it on YouTube. Yes, and together with that um, economic data that they've done, you know, 
I've, together with our advisors, have done modelling on our, our own farms as well. Um, and those do seem to line up with the economic um, outcomes that uh, those three people have, have developed. Yes, thank you. Well, now, I had understood from your evidence the, a point that you have uh, been developing in your summary for us. The Trust wants, you say, a formal commitment from ECAN to form a partnership, a commitment to do with sections of the community. My first question about that is, would that be an appropriate topic for an approach to ECAN Direct rather than for a policy in a regional plan? And if you'd rather yeah, leave that question to someone else, you may. Yes. Yes, Miss Rustin's probably the best person to answer that. Right, well, I'll try and remember to ask you. So, I've just, just still got a little bit of a reservation about um, understanding how this would work. Would it be, as it works, if it, if it was identifying your group, for instance, amongst other groups, and no doubt yours is amongst the most worthy, but we wouldn't really want to see in the regional plan something that's selective amongst the, the total community that the regional plan serves, would we? I'm not quite with you. How do you mean selective? Well, if you're having a formal commitment in the regional plan that ECAN would have a partnership with you, not, not you personally, yep. but your yep. um, next generation farmers, and I'm not in any way belittling the, the value of your organisation, far from it, it's admirable, but to have something in the, in the regional plan that specifically identifies this particular group that the council is going to have a commitment with, okay, it would be a legal commitment, just doesn't look, it looks to me as if it's selecting one part of the community from the whole. Yeah, I think it, it probably, um perhaps hasn't been explained that well, um, we'd be really looking for a collaborative approach with other industry stakeholders in any such partnership. Um, you know, involving, involving as many stakeholders as we could in, in, in such a monitoring programme. And you see, I, I think I'm, I'm getting a clear idea from when you start to use the word stakeholders, and of course I, understand how you feel about it. You yourselves, all of you, your organisation, have, have a commitment to what you're doing and you have stakes in it and you've got enormously weighty stakes, I expect. There are other organisations in the community as well, different but also worthy, also admirable, but who have different approaches to some of these issues, and we've been hearing from them as well. You wouldn't want the, the regional council to be excluding people with different points of view and only uh, having this kind of partnership association with those who have a particular kind of stake in the region. Yes, yes, fully you, agree. You and that, that? Yes, fully agree and, and probably hasn't been explained that well, but our intention is to, um, would be to try and uh, involve 
uh, when I say stakeholders, I mean all all parts of community, all the parts of the community, and all parts of the zone, all sides of uh, of these arguments, for lack of a better term. Um, yeah, no, fully understand what you're saying, and I think we we are would be on your wavelength in terms of sharing this um, monitoring and research, so that. Um, we're, we're all aware of the data that's coming out of the uh, water quality monitoring. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. That, that That's an answer that, that I'm, I'm glad to accept from you. And uh, I'll be interested to see Ms. Rustin's, um, or to hear Ms. Rustin's comments on it too, because she may be able to bring something from her particular qualifications and experience that would help us to understand how best to proceed in that regard. In any event, uh, your, your uh, commitment yourselves to what you're doing and, and how, how to manage in the future is of course uh, admirable and we thank you very much for coming and telling us about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next witness is Mr. Austin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Austin. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. And thank you for the opportunity to submit some evidence. Thank you. Um, I'm basically going to uh, talk about um, achieving these reductions by 2040. 20 years away is, is quite a long time. And if I look back 20 years to, to, to see how much has changed in this 20 years, I believe that's quite unrealistic. Um, the efficiencies of science and technology that exist now, that if you look back 20 years, you wouldn't actually believe it could happen. Um, <laughs> On the farm at the moment, uh, you know, you look at science. Back 20 years ago, they were producing grasses that had grass daggers and the sheep would be falling over and stuff like that. But they managed to identify the endophytes and took the one piece of uh, endophyte out which caused the grass daggers, but the other two were good endophytes which stopped drought grasses and stuff like that. So that was one thing. Uh, they're producing later flowering grasses, which, which help us to higher production, so as soon as the grass goes to flower, the uh, production goes down. Um, and I've just heard on the way here from a friend who's in the seed industry that they're producing wheat now that can transform uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere into their leaves and be able to grow bigger seed. So there's all sorts of changes going on in science. Um, GPS is another uh, thing that had a big influence with measuring land. I can do most of my stuff on my phone um, okay. with GPS. Um, uh, with fertiliser, they have proof of placement of fertiliser. Um, they have uh, my irrigator. Uh, my uh, irrigator it has a thing called VRI, which is variable rate irrigation. I've had my land density tested, and it's only providing the amount of water that's required. So. Um, and so fertiliser has also changed. Um, we've, soil tests have been a lot better. Um, we have thing now co coated urea, which doesn't actually takes a long time to release compared with what it used to do. Um, and also have had huge benefits out of doing an environment plan. On my light land soils on my farm, I've changed grasses with more legumes. I'm not getting the grass scrub or and I'm getting a lot more production, and I'm not having to apply urea, so, or nitrogen. Another influence is data collection. I invested um, in some new cattle yards, which have uh, these waste scales. And with that, um, with the benefit of that, we were able to weigh our cattle, and in winter feeding time, we realised that the way we were doing it, driving across wet paddocks with silage and stuff like that, 
that our cattle are only putting on 0.2 of a kilogram a day. And so we received an idea to set up uh, feed stations. And using the data we collected in our weight gains, we were able to achieve an extra half kilogram a day, going up to 0.7 a day. Um, it's improved our soil, improved our soil for, for cultivation and pugging and, um, and its texture. It's improved the animals, uh, less pugging and everything. And uh, yeah, our soil structures are so a bit better. Just in conclusion, change is going to happen at a rapid rate and it's going to happen a lot, I believe it's going to happen a lot quicker in the next 10 years than it has in the last 20 years. So, um, and predicting what will happen and what we need 20 years, let alone in the next 10, in my view, is, is, is I don't, I, I, you know, it's unrealistic. Um, as a member of the NGF, um, they're made up of young, energetic, enthusiastic, good people who care deeply about sustainability of farming for the betterment of the future generations and their communities, and will have ability through their network to solve problems and to share new solutions. Um, another thing is that, in conclusion, I did a master, as you saw in my submission, I did a master's in, 19, in 2014, which is farmers' perceptions of ECAN's proposed good practice discharge allowance in the Waimaki, Waimakari sub-region of environment Canterbury. And while I was reading my um, uh, literature review, I had a quick look at it, uh, I noticed that a brat in 2002 did a study on farmers' choices, management practices to reduce nutrient leakages within a Swedish catchment. He suggests that in his conclusion, for rules and regulations, the best results were achieved when farmers themselves perceived to see a benefit from cooperation and compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Any questions for Mr. Austin? Commissioner Van Vorthuisen? <clears throat> no, no questions, thank you. Commissioner Solomon? No, no questions from me either. Can I just add to the uh, changes that you were talking about and foreseeing over the next 10 or 15 years, Mr. Austin? We're told that there's quite substantial climate change uh, expected over the next uh, decade or two as well. So that only adds a further area of uh, challenge, really. But thank you very much for coming in and giving us your evidence, Mr. Austin. Thank you indeed. Thank you for the opportunity. The next witness, um, witnesses is uh, Rosemary and Hazel Clark. I think um, thank you. Ms. Clark will, will speak to it. Yep. Um, no, thank you. Um, apologies on behalf of Dave Clark. He wanted to pre present today, but he has taken ill, who's my father in law, and this beside me is Rosie, my mother in law. Um, but I will speak on behalf of him the words that he wanted to share. Splendid. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, I wish to highlight some key points from our original statement. We farm in cast area of our Waimak district. We farm predominantly sheep and beef breeding and finishing with 30 hectares of crop and grain. We irrigate 100 hectares with wool shears, but also lease dryland properties where we are at the mercy, mercy of Canterbury droughts. We believe in farming to be a generational land caretakers and want to ensure future generations are able to operate in the most sustainable manner. We believe this will be able to be achieved by measured science, not mythology. We don't want to see our community change from a family owned farming operations to corporate affairs. We bought our core farm 
153 hectares coming 40 years ago and joined the community where our children were born. In a small community, you get to know everyone. We became involved in almost everything from working bees, fundraisers, committees, school trips, teacher aides and joining local sports clubs. Having our own farm gave us flexibility to work around events that we didn't want to miss and to be so involved in our community. When we use contractors on farm, we use local contractors for hay, cultivation, crop spraying, sheep shearing, engineering, tree trimming and more. These people all help make our community. Being part of the community gives us an identity and a sense of well-being. With regards to our farm, we have been making improvements for good management practice. We have replaced K-line irrigation systems with a pivot irrigation which allows us monitor, to monitor and adjust applications more closely. It came at a cost of more than 150000 at a time, taking into account the refencing of paddocks. We have last summer put in water troughs, a water trough scheme, six troughs supply 11 paddocks with drinking water for cattle. This came at a cost of 20000 The water pump power account has more than doubled and we are left wondering at the sense of pumping water from underground aquifers when water is flowing past. Our fencing does allow sheep to still drink from the stock water race. We have done nutrient budgets and environmental plans and have practiced best farming practices over several years now. We use advisors for fertilizer, seed and spray applications. We are making some changes to our cultivation system with our purchase of direct drill. Our practices are changing as new developments are occurring as science allows us to be more precise in our methods to optimise the best outcomes. Overseer version changes with our baseline N is hard to prove we are doing the best we can to, be, to make environmental changes. Even though over the modelling time period our stock numbers haven't changed, we have made development changes on farm for example, pivot irrigation from Rotorana and K-lines. Our baseline numbers have fluctuated over the years from different models, from 8, then 39, then 53, and now 34. Our improved systems should be making our baseline reduce. The numbers do not reflect the improvements. To achieve a 15% reduction will involve more capital for us, but will will this actually result in a lower figure? We have never been followers of high-end fertiliser use as it wasn't a road we wanted to take our operation. We are glad that science has shown other implications to high-end input, but we, are, we hope it isn't going to be at the detriment of future generations farming our land as reductions from our low baseline are needed to be met. We are known for our large, well-fed sheep now, so by reducing stock numbers will create health issues, having bigger, heavier animals and having lambing and shearing problems. We are committed to running our farming operations in sustainable, responsible manner. We understand the need for change. That is why in our operation we have made adaptations to our system for land and waterways. Age object, for example, moisture <laughs> monitoring meters and pivot irrigation. We want to be assured that technology and scientific advantages advances. Oh, sorry, we want to be assured with the technology and scientific advantages advances we can adapt to meet the 220, 2030 changes. Thank you. Any questions? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Clark. Uh, does Mrs. Clark Senior wish to add anything to that? Uh, no, thank you. Well, you're, you're fortunate that your, your daughter in law can stand in. When I, you I, that I, well. I am, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for, for Madame Clark, Commissioner Van Vortesen? 
Just a couple of uh, minor questions. Um, in your written evidence in your table one, you had your um, different baseline figures from overseer as 839, 53 and 42. And when you uh, were presenting verbally, you said 839, 53 and I think 34. Yeah, so the latest model of data has come out at 34, so right. this, that's this year's okay. data is 34. Sorry, we might have missed that's right. 42. Um, oh, so is the 42... In between, 8, 39, 53, 42, and now 34. Okay, so 34 tax on the bottom of that. Yeah. Okay. So that's for the 2020 or the, the next year. Yeah. It's more... Oh, yeah, sorry. It's more the fact that the versions keep changing. Yeah, yeah the modeling. I understand that. Yeah. Just something I was curious about in your uh, paragraph 3.12, so just below that table, you've got there um, deaths due to pivot system. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just explain how that occurs? Um, so, the, would you like to explain it or do you want me to? Um, well, well, as the pivot creeps along quietly, um, yeah. You know, the sheep sleep soundly, and next thing they find themselves caught. So we have to manage that now when we know that the pivot is approaching a paddock where there are sheep, we, we have to move those sheep, take them out of the way. Right. Does it run them over or something? Yeah, it does. Really? It's not nice. Oh. Yeah. OK. Thank you. That was all. Commissioner Solomon. That was actually my only question as well for um, the submitter, so, but she's answered that now. Thank you. I, I think I heard you say that the, the sheep were drinking from the stock water race. Is that right? Yes, they can. Our fencing does allow for the sheep to, to drink the water. And, and do they? Uh, yes, they do. They do, yes. and they drink from the stock water race, yes. Yes. Splendid. Well, thank, thank you both for coming in and giving us your uh, description of how these things might affect you and uh, what, what your suggestions are, and we're grateful. And uh, although we're, we're sorry to hear that Mr. Clark is, uh, Mr. Clark Senior is not well, uh, Matt has been managed very well by those who've come to the staff side. Thank you. Thank you. So the next witness is Mr Richard Stalker. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Stalker. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Commissioners. Thank you very much for coming in. We are grateful that you, we have your evidence, which we've read, and uh, we understand you're now going to just give us a, a, a few words of summary. How, how do you like to proceed? Mm. Uh, yes, a, a few words of summary, but also some expansion on the main topic. So hopefully that uh, Thank you. fits within it. My name is Richard Stalker and I thank the Commissioners for the opportunity to present. I'm presenting supporting stories to my evidence which focus on the three topics of wellbeing, collaboration and the role of our farmer-owned cooperative Fonterra. Our family has farmed in the Rangiora district since the 1860s. We were one of the original dairy conversions in Canterbury, converting in the late 1880s. In the last 20 years, we've grown cow numbers from 140 to 1,400. We grew our business not for ego nor greed, but to stay viable. The easier and more economically sensible option may have been to sell to four hectare blocks. But we had a legacy to honour and a hard-earned respect for the land and our animals. 
I was raised on the hardships our family went through in the Great Depression. The death of my grandfather and six-year-old uncle Bill when my father was still a teenager and how farming was not a choice for my father. It was an obligation and the only option we had. Farming is a challenge we rise to and one that makes us who we are. My underlying message to the Commission is that as farmers, we agree with the direction of travel with environmental reforms. But the speed of change and the emotional toll on many of our farmers is too great. We can see a way to 2020, but we struggle to see a pathway beyond that. You said 2020. Oh, 2040, sorry. Whoops. Yes. Um, if, a, if a society is judged on how it treats its most vulnerable, then PC7 will be judged on how it treats the most vulnerable farmers. Mental health issues are just the tip of the iceberg. There is also a very large impact on the well-being of those who cope but cannot thrive. I was lucky enough to be part of a team that redesigned Fonterra's purpose into response to demand from Fonterra farmers and from stakeholders that we change our focus. The purpose of an organisation comes first, then values and vision. Strategy is born from these guiding principles. It is the purpose that, that directors and all of us answer to. It is the reason an organisation exists. Purpose is the boss. It is important to realise that Fonterra's old purpose was to feed two billion people. Fonterra's new purpose is our cooperative empowers people, creates goodness for generations, you, me, us together, tato, tato. We've shifted our focus from one that encouraged growth on a world scale to one looking after and promoting what we have within New Zealand. The new Fonterra purpose is important because it highlights the three points of my evidence. Collaboration, wellbeing, and the role of farming cooperatives in the way forward. Please don't underestimate the soul searching and change that has occurred behind closed doors. We've beaten ourselves up enough. We don't need society to do it as well. When shown mutual respect and empathy, that respect and empathy will be magnified and returned by all stakeholders. I share with this, you, with this with you because the Fonterra purpose and what I'm hearing is the purpose of the greater public, iwi and ECAN around water align nicely. We need to harness the power of that shared purpose and collaboration that already exists. The first line of the Fonterra purpose is our cooperative empowers people. People are very much at the heart of the way our cooperative operates. As a community, we also need to connect worlds and empower each other. The line in the Fonterra purpose creates goodness for generations, refers to the goodness of our product, and also the goodness that we need to leave intact for the environment and our community. You, me, us together in the Fonterra purpose is also inspired from cooperative and iwi philosophy. The word you is intentionally put first, by putting your perspective before mine, we have a much greater chance of us all getting what is desired. Your success is our success. Collaboration is not just about working with this generation. There is a need to respect the past and also to pass on a legacy for the well-being of future generations. With regard to well-being, our family doctor explained to me what he's seen in the wider farming community. For 20 years, he has seen farmers under stress and he has contacted politicians in the past for support. The response he received was that farmers are a resilient lot and that we will be okay. The grit and determination that defines farmers and our perceived resilience risks being used against us. People think that we can cope with anything. We may have lost the chair. All oh, right. Is it here? So, enough? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. Um, uh, Commissioner Shepherd, are you back on? You, we lost you for a minute. Yes, yes, you seem to, but I'm definitely uh, still <laughs> yeah, right. right. Okay, I'll, um, I'll back the truck up a little, but not too much. Um, the response. Let, let me say, let me say this. I, 
I, I was particularly making a note of a, a comment that you were making by reference to some wise comment from a doctor about passing on um, for, for well-being of future generations. And I don't think it was that uh, piece of wisdom that caused the connection to fail. <laughs> as far as I got, so you can carry on from there. Okay, I haven't carried on too long, so that's fine. Um, for 20 years, our doctor has seen farmers under stress, and he contacted politicians and passed for support. The response he received was that farmers are resilient lot and that we'll be, we will be okay. The grit and determination that defines farmers and our perceived resilience risk being used against us. People think we can cope with anything, but that is not always the case. We're described as a resilient group, but resilience just means that you get good at losing. One of my concerns is that the noise around farming is drowning out our internal environmental leaders. Many of our efforts are concentrated on a potentially destructive us versus them approach to change, and we're missing the opportunity to really do this collaboratively. PC is a PC7 is a massive opportunity to embed collaboration but it also risks cementing divisions. To finish, I'd like to share two positive stories, how working collaboratively enhances farmer wellbeing and how farmers need to be part of the team and a valued part of, a valued part of the solution. Many of you may know Bill Wilson, who was a local farmer who was passionate about the environment. Several years ago, I took the opportunity to travel around our lowland streams with Bill Bill was not in good health, and I was conscious that the more knowledge that we can pass from one generation to the next, the better we are, all are for it. Bill took me to many streams. I particularly remember Bill me showing me the Taranaki stream, where it passes behind Pegasus Township. There was a clear flowing stream, ample native riparian plantings, and it was clear the pride that Bill had taken in his part of this rehabilitation. Bill turned to me and said in a self-reflective way, Richard, clear, beautiful water. For a man close to the end of his life, the thing he was incredibly proud of was his contribution to our water. Please don't underestimate the goodness of our farming community and our desire to do the right thing. By definition, quiet achievements are not shouted from the rooftops. It is not who we are. My last story connects the three areas, my three areas of evidence. The story of the Northbrook stream is one of collaboration, our farming cooperative's contribution, and the well-being of farmers and the community. The story of the Northbrook stream demonstrates the significant but quiet improvements we've made together as a community over the last 20 years. The Northbrook stream originates at Springheads within the Rangiora Township. As a pitchery stream, which used to pick up debris from the roads and also picked up all the sewage from the Rangiora Township, which flowed into the stream. This was only 20 years ago. The water flows through the farm where we now share milk, where water was extracted and applied, applied for irrigation at what at the time was new, te new technology, but has now been updated. Fencing of waterways was yet to be made mandatory by Fonterra, we had no concept of the idea of nutrient leaching and overseer, and we'd lost touch with our neighbours at the Tuahiwi Marae, where the water from the Northbrook flowed in front of the meeting house. And, and water from wells was extracted for Rangura town water, and these wells had a connected hydraulic effect of taking 50% of the water allocation above minimum flow from the Northbrook. Rangura was looking for more community function centres, and we did a growing need to preserve our local history. So I'd like to share as a community what has been achieved with the collaboration of the Waimak District Council, ECAN, Iwi, farm owners and the local community. The sewage doesn't flow into the Northbrook stream anymore. The water tests very clearly and town water is pumped from a well that doesn't interfere with the Northbrook flow. Buffers and subdivisions allow heavy metals to settle out and filter rubbish. The stream and tributaries are fenced with a riparian margin and stock have long been excluded. In the past 10 years, the farm owners have invested over 700,000 in upgrading effluent storage and installing the most efficient forms of pivot irrigation. The farm owners have built a community centre called Rossburn Receptions, 
which hosts many weddings, funerals and, the community, and other community events. This was badly needed in Rangiora. It is the income from dairy farming that has allowed investment back into the quality of our water and community infrastructure. The farm owners also have an extensive museum that has preserved a great deal of Rangiora history. And we're starting to know our neighbours again at the local Runanga. We understand what can be achieved by collaboration and focusing on well-being and why clean water is so important to the iwi and to everyone in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Stalker. Uh, any questions of Mr. Stalker, Commissioner Van Portesen? You could just remind me what um, nitrogen priority priority area sub area you're in. You're in A, B, C, D, or E. Uh, we're in many different zones. We've got 21 landlords, so we've got properties everywhere. All over the place. Yeah, so. Um, we're not in the highest risk, the high, the ones that are being asked to reduce the most. But there's definitely, yeah, we'd, yeah. we have lots of reductions to do. All right, thank you. Commissioner Solomon. Yes, and I feel a bit odd because you've been talking big picture, collaborative, collaborative, great stuff. And now I have to take you back to your submission <laughs> and talk about the waterways on your property. Yep. How many waterways are on your property? I'm referring to your paragraph four. Uh, we've got, um, with all the lease land, three, four, five kilometres. Okay. And, and they, they've been actively fenced off and riparian margins planted, have they? They've been... It's a massive job, as you yes, can understand. Yes, yes. Um, and Fonterra came round about 10 years ago and actively inspected those. And the comment the Fonterra person made to me was, um, farmers didn't want Fonterra on the land, us showing them what we'd done. And he said, this is so silly because everyone's fenced it. Mm. And, um, yeah, and that was, Fonterra led the way with that 10 years ago, which, so, and it's like fencing is second nature and now we're expanding the riparian. So our know, thinking's gone from two metres to five metres. Our thinking's gone from rank grass to native corridors and you know, extending. So don't you think all that great work should be celebrated? I mean, I understand your humility, but don't you think that great work should be celebrated? It should definitely be celebrated, but every time you let someone onto your farm, you're letting them into your heart. Yeah, and you're worried that they're going to say the wrong thing. I just think that it would do good because there are people, as you've said, out there that um, are not so positive about farmers. Yeah. So I think farmers should celebrate what they're doing and not be so humble about it. We've also been accused of being arrogant in the past. So we've got this... Um, yeah, it's easy. It's, I'd much rather be accused of being... Um, humble and arrogant, so I get yeah. That. But, but I, I yeah. agree, and, and we try that, and yeah, we had this massive um, publicity campaign. But unless people believe in their hearts, they, uh, so we'd love to know how to do that. And I think the next generation farmers—that's a core mm. theme of theirs, because mm. we haven't done it very well. Mm. Let's hope the next generation can come along and do it better than we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I have no more questions, thank you. There was a piece of uh, social philosophy that you were introducing, <laughs> Mr Stalker, about thinking about those who, who cope but cannot thrive. Mm. And as a, as a piece of general social philosophy, I uh, endorse that, and I'm sure that uh, most of the community do. But what we're looking at at the moment is something rather narrower than the general philosophy of a community. We've got a problem that you all recognise, an environmental problem, and the environment 
doesn't respond according to with the people uh, coping well or barely coping at all, let alone the reasons why and what can be done of a social kind to address those reasons. If we if we had things in a in a regional plan that required differently of those who are coping and those who are barely coping or scarcely coping at all, then we get a lot of criticism that this is selective, whereas something that the public authority does should fall equally on all. So I'm not sure whether I fully understood the point that you're making. I've got these reservations about it. I thought I should try and explain them to you in case you can uh, clarify for me. Uh, thank you, and, and point taken. We can cope to a point. So we can cope to 2040, is what next generation farms are saying. It's it's beyond that. It's when, if we legislate, if we put in practice now having to go to 95% reductions or whatever it might be, that becomes very hard to cope with because your land value is destroyed and you don't have a future. So um, they are you know, the most vulnerable I'm talking about. Also, um, yeah, there's, we, we don't, we risk taking out a group of farmers if we're not, if we're not careful. Does that? Does that? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for coming in, Mr. Stalker, and giving us your views. So. Cool. Thanks for your time. So our penultimate witness, sir, is Miss Victoria Trainer. Thank you. So, Ms. Trainer, uh, we'll, we'll commence with a mihi. Yes, thank you. Uh, Kora Tenekato, Ko Victoria Chena, Toko Ngoa, Ko Tamariki, Lacey, Mayala, and Bonnie, Ko Timpali, Trainer, Toko Fanao, Ko Naitahu, Toko Iwi, Ko Waimakere, Toko Awa, Ko Araki, Tinmonga, Norena, Tenekoto, Tenekoto, Kato. Hello, thank you for having me here today. Kia ora. Yeah. Are you going to read something to us or are you going to speak ad lib? But you're going to speak to uh, to what you think about this, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take questions about my submission, uh, the evidence on the 17th of July, but I have just got a couple of key points that I would like to um, just talk yes. about freely. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, once again, thank you for your time today and your correlation of all the evidence to date. I understand that would have been a massive task of yours. Um, so thank you for all that. Um, I'm a really proud farmer and I pride myself on being a caretaker of my mana whenua. As my whakapapa have done before me, I am the fifth generation of my whā now. And it is my life's purpose to make sure that my tamariki and the next gen generation have the choice to be sustainable farmers in the Waimakariri and able to live off the land in Aotearoa. As farmers, we respect our wai, our awa and our whenua, and we breathe it every day. It's culturally who we are. The land and rivers are a part of the Kiwi tradition, and an important part means it provides high quality produce for kai, for our whānau and our consumers. As I agree with PC7, needs to nurture our environment, but I struggle to understand the restraints that the time frames, modelled measures, are simply unre unrealistic in some sense, and the consciousness that will flow onto the economy and the social just sits on uneasy with me. Um, as I've engaged in this process um, and listened to both sides of the 
the story, you know, it's painted that the evidence to date could hinder the end goal of what PC7 originally was about. Um, in my submission, I demonstrate a five-year plan. Within that five-year plan, as farmers, we take a huge diligence in um, the environmental outcomes and how that looks. But we also take a very balanced approach, as most businesses would, that everything pays an equal part to get the outcomes desired. Risk planning is huge, and as my fellow farmers would know, the environmental uncertainties upon us with NPS 2020, PC7, the carbon, creates quite a grey area in our risk planning. Um, the scope that we can rely on is our industry bodies and the innovation that they deliver for us to navigate through these. However, we do need time, time for science, time for better monitoring, time for measurement, so that we can make a difference that will sustain an outcome that my tamariki can live through. Quite happy to take any questions. Thank you. Commissioner Van Vorderson? No, no questions from me, thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? No, I have no questions, but I do want to say I thank you for your mahi. I thought it was very brave of you, and you did a great job. And I have no questions. Thank you. Yeah. When you speak about taking a balanced approach, we, we being told, and the, the regional council is being told, I believe, that that's not been working and that we now have to have a more specific and direct attention to what comes first, the health and well-being of the water bodies we're concerned and their ecosystems is the first priority. And then the, the needs of the health of the people is the second priority. And th things like the profitability of farming and, and other businesses are a third priority. Are you familiar with these new ideas that uh, the Regional Council has to address? Absolutely, and I can cope quote to you the Regional Council policy statement which, which seeks to enable people, communities to provide for their social economical well-being while enabling rural activities including primary production. I'm not disagreeing with that at all. The question, oh, the question that I do have around the balanced approach is that currently in the current modelled state is that we aren't seeing evidence of this balanced approach because it's taken by a a medium number rather than what's probably been uh, gathered in the scheme to date. Um, and that's, I mean, I know that we have to have a modelling system, but we don't really know the equivalence or the, the actual current environmental state to the degree of actual fact. So the balanced approach to me has to start now so that in 10 years' time we know exactly what is a balanced outcome in terms of what we need to pull or push or unders and overs, whatever way you want to look at it. Well, thank you for that. The other part of the important things you've been telling us relates to the timing of when things have to be done. If the, if the understanding is that the freshwater environment is degrading, how long do we have to wait before action is taken that stops it degrading? I'm not asking you to wait because we're already on that pathway. So we're already in that, mo that motion going forward. What I'm asking is that to date we don't have current data of actual outcomes. So if we pause in a 10-year review, say 2030 or 2040, and had a look at those modelled outcomes, 
we could see the benefit or the hard work that the people behind me actually are doing. I mean, even, I mean, I sit on the Waimaki Irrigation Board and looking at the PDT modelling that's happened in the last six months to date, there has been significant improvements, but that's not captured. The other aspect to that is that overseers not capturing a lot of these improvements, which we've also seen in the evidence um, multiple times during this process. So the timeframes that I'm alluding to is that we need science to catch up to what's actually happening on the ground so that the farmer's story or that the farmer's social, you know, which Richard touched on, can actually be rewarded and recognised. Um, and that's close to my heart, um, definitely, because that's what's going to motivate those behaviours for farmers to move forward through these. Well, thank you very much for that answer and for coming in and uh, giving us your take on all of these important issues that you're addressing. Thank you. Thank you. Now, finally, uh, Ms Sue Rustin has expert planning evidence. Thank you. Rustin, we, we've had the good fortune to uh, be able to read your statement of evidence. Thank you for that. But you'd like to speak to it before we come to questions, I think. Is that right? Um, only briefly, Commissioner, there's a couple of updates and corrections and a point of clarification I'd like to make. Um, Thank you. Just briefly, and it's minor, it's administrative, but it's an update from my evidence in chief, uh, which was submitted in July. Um, and it states that I'm a director and employee of Inspire Consulting Limited. I have since, in August, uh, resigned from that company, so that fact is no longer correct. Um, I am, uh, I have established my own business and I am subcontracted back to Inspire, so still working for Next Generation Farmers Trust uh, through Inspire as a contractor. I'm no longer a director or employee with them. Uh, so that's a correction to paragraph 1.2 on page 2. There's a related correction to 1.3. Uh, paragraph 1.3 on page 2. I'm no longer a member of the Institute of Directors either. That's the administrative angle. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do have uh, two corrections uh, of substance in the body of my evidence. The first is paragraph 6.6 .6 on page 9. That's okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Page 9. Paragraph 6.6. .6. Yes, thank you. Yes, of course. Great. In the first line of that paragraph, I refer to the OTOP subregion. That's an yes. error. That should refer to the Waimakariri subregion. Yes. I think we understood that. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, yeah. The second correction um, may or may not be of key importance. It relates to the table one on page 21, where I present a hypothetical scenario 
of how the difference between Plan Change 7 and the NGF's proposal plays out for a hypothetical farm. I do apologise in bringing the table over from Excel to Word. It has done some strange rounding of numbers. It doesn't change my conclusions. It doesn't change the relationship that the table's trying to show, but it perhaps muddies people's <laughs> understanding of that relationship. So um, without going into all the detailed decimal points, I can provide a corrected table through the administrator for you. Yes. Um, That'll be the best thing. Great. Um, one key, key and simple change uh, to understand would be in the second half of that table, so the part that refers to PC7's um, outcomes for that hypothetical farm, the right-hand column should, in every cell, say 7.5. So that number doesn't change. Yeah. But I will provide an updated table for you to the administrator. Splendid, thank you. The last point is a point of clarification. As we all know, the um, NPS FM 2020 came into force after our evidence in chief was lodged. So I have put my mind to considering my evidence and my conclusions in the light of that policy statement and have deter, you know, uh, questioned myself as to whether my conclusions would have changed any, or, or, or to a large degree the comments that uh, form the rationale behind my conclusions. And I can confirm that they don't. Um, I've particularly put my mind to the hierarchy of priorities and the objective for the NPSFM. Um, uh, the, the trust, and, and certainly myself, in looking at my planning evidence, haven't questioned the water quality outcomes that are looking to be achieved. Um, they have put their minds more to, as I have as a planner, have put my minds more to the, the um, which of the two options better meets the regulatory requirements. Uh, so I see the proposals of both the Plan Change 7 and the Trust's proposals as both being uh, not inconsistent with the NPSFM 2020. Yeah. And to further that, my conclusion still remains that the NGF's proposal better meets the NPSFM 2020 than does PC7. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm conscious of the two questions that were asked earlier in this hearing session, and I'm happy to address them directly now if you would like. Thank you. Okay. They both refer to um, the proposed drafting that I offered on page 31 of my evidence. Page 31, excuse me. Yes, yes, that's it. Great, and at the bottom of yes. that page, there's a, um, an offering of a new policy. So the offering of that new policy is not fundamental to the assessment and conclusions made in my evidence itself. It was more an offering of drafting to address uh, one of the matters that the trust had been seeking. The first question I had on that policy was from Commissioner Van Vorthuizen. And if I'm correct, that question was asking whether that policy could be amended to incorporate A to C of, I think it was paragraph 11 of Mr Christensen's evidence. Yep. So I have put my mind to that and I certainly think that uh, it could uh, be amended to incorporate A to C, and I'm happy to draft something along those lines if that's helpful to you, and again, provide that to the administrator tomorrow. Thank you. The second question that related to that 
policy in, indirectly, but was the question to uh, Mr Spencer Bauer about uh, singling out parts of the community as opposed to uh, referring to stakeholders more broadly, and would that be appropriate or not? And I certainly, um, uh, my opinion is that it, it should not exclude, it should be inclusive of, of all stakeholders, and it can be amended along those lines uh, at the same time as providing the changes uh, referred to in response to Commissioner Van Vorthuizen's question. Well, thank you, Ms. Rustin. I think while we've got that particular topic in mind, I'll uh, jump to the head of the queue in, in asking questions because I want to, to, to think of this again. Can a plan policy effectively commit future councils like this? Are details about working with stakeholders, or however we describe them, not matters for executive decisions by elected councillors for the time being, rather than for a planning policy yes. in a statutory instrument? Yes, um, I do agree with exactly what you've just said. Um, the uh, uh, policies requiring this, the type of action that's uh, drafted there, uh, while, I, while I'm not aware of a di distinct um, uh, part of the regulation that prevents it, um, I, don't, I don't think they are um, helpful and they can be problematic. So my preference is not to include a policy as it's drafted there at the moment. Uh, it was primarily offered uh, as, a, as a, an option of drafting if the commissioners had supported that aspect of the Trust's submissions. Yes, well, I certainly understand that. Well, now, um, I think there's another question that I'll ask while I've taken the floor. Is it, is it possible? A couple of my colleagues. Is it possible to ask a point of clarification just before we move on, Commissioner Shepherd, just on that policy? Of course. If I'm to provide... <laughs> I'm here to listen to you. <laughs> Thank you. If I am providing um, drafting changes to that to reflect A to C of paragraph 11 of Mr Christensen's evidence, is your preference that it not incorporate effectively what is there currently? I think that I will be content with whatever you professionally feel is right. Great, okay. And I don't want to constrain in any way what you tell us in your expert witness capacity, which I value and respect. Thank you. You, you don't need me to remind you that we expect of experts that they are independent and objective, mm. and and I know that you are and that you will do it professionally and that that's what we want. Thank you. But I have a different question now. If we go to, to your 9.26 on page 26, where you are reminding us of objective CB1 and policy CB1 of the, the third version of the NPS, that's to say the 2017 version. Mm. Now we're carrying into the, to the fourth version, the 2020 version. Have these particular 
objective and policy being brought into the 2020 version? Um, I don't have the answer to that off the top of my head. Sorry, I would have to look at the two versions side by side. Yeah. Can that be a part, another part of your homework? Yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Will allow you to, to answer that uh, at the same time as you're bringing us the other material. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Questions for Ms Rustin, Commissioner Van Voorthuizen. Yes, just I don't have any questions from the body of the evidence, not in terms of clarifying what you uh, had there. I understand that. <clears throat> just turning again to the um, uh, suggested track changes in your Appendix 3 and that policy at the bottom of the page that we've been discussing. Um, similar issue to the Chair raised, my understanding is that a policy can't commit a Council to do monitoring. It could maybe reflect on what might occur or what could be done if monitoring is undertaken, but it can't direct it to occur for the reasons that the Chair outlined. So when, um, when you put some thought to um, considering how this provision might be amended, I'd perhaps invite you to look at um, policy 8425 um, that's already in the plan uh, and it may be um, a better place to add some provisions to that that would reflect I think the outcome that the submitter is seeking, which is to lock in the 2030 and 24 reductions and then to pause, reflect on monitoring data, modelling results that are available at that time and then consider if further reductions are required. Um, over to you, but that might be a better place to put the kind of policy that you're suggesting here into the framework of the plan. And if you're happy to do that and, and, and provide some wording, that would be, that would be helpful. Absolutely, that's no problem. But no questions apart from that. Any questions, Commissioner Solomon? No, no questions from me either, thank you. Well, thank you, Ms Rustin. We've uh, add, added to your burdens, but here we are. That's what happens. That's no problem. Well, thank you, sir and commissioners. Um, that concludes the case for the Next Generation Farmers Trust. Thank you. Well, we're very grateful to, to have uh, met and to, to have some understanding of what these people are doing and seriously addressing issues about future farming, and we compliment them. Thank you, sir. Now, the next submitted on our agenda this afternoon is Aqualink Research. Okay, apologies for keeping you waiting. I popped out to the car to try and find my glasses, and uh, they weren't in the car either, so um, I might need to read some of this at an arm's length. So, But uh, thank well, you. Good Sorry. afternoon. Good afternoon. We, you're Mr. Bubb, aren't you? I am, yes. Matthew Bubb from Aqualink. Yes. And we have already got some material from you that we have read, the original submission. And also... Oh, this thing's a bit slow. So we have your submission and we have your evidence statement and we've read those. So you you can now be free to address us on the topics. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and only a couple of minor sort of technical um, issues that I want to talk about today uh, involving um, Plan Change 7 and, and the, just specifically the Heinz area and specifically about the um, swapping of surface water and shallow groundwater for, for deep groundwater. Um, the, the first part um, involves policy 13.4.24, um, and that is not a policy that I um, made a submission on directly, but it 
was evident that the in the ECAN officer's report, they used my submission on the rules as part of the reasoning for um, them proposing some changes on this policy. Um, so given that that was the case, I was hoping that that gave me scope to actually comment on it. But I must admit I wasn't 100% sure. Well, you don't need to worry about the scope. <laughs> that, okay. That's not, not that. For, for the moment, we can tentatively take it that this is consequential on the, on the change to the rule or consideration of the change to the rule. And if they've addressed it, then you certainly should have the opportunity to respond to their addressing of it in the policy, and we welcome you doing that. Great, thank you. Um, and and it's, it's really just a, a minor point um, that within the proposed drafting of the policy um, in the officer's report, it specifically relates to to the take, taking of deep groundwater. And my concern about that is, is that the, there's a definition of deep groundwater in the plan, and it specifically talks about, well, well it is, the definition is, is, is a well that's over 80 metres deep. And what I'm really quite keen to ensure doesn't happen is that this could only be four wells that are over 80 metres deep, because I don't think that that reflects the, uh, what the plan is trying to achieve. I, th I think the plan is trying to, 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 um, um, to encourage people to go to a deeper well and get away from the surface water and the shallow groundwater. And, and in, certainly in my view, the key to that deeper well is that it's not connected or is there is a low connection um, of, of hydraulic connection to any, any water body. So I'm just trying to get away from the sort of words of deep groundwater because of the definition and, and make sure that, uh, that shallower bores can be considered as long as it can be shown that they are not stream depleting or that they are uh, either not stream depleting or have a low stream depletion effect according to the plan. Well, that part of it was quite, quite well clearly stated in your evidence Great. as well. Thank you. Easy to understand. Thank you. Okay, moving on to Rule um, 13.530. There is... Uh, I think it seems to be a forest and bird submission that... Um, required that in the middle of condition six, there was, um, there was reference to uh, the annual volume. Um, that there was um, yeah, a cap on the, the annual volume. Um, my concern here, this, this is to do with um, dr the drilling of a deep bore in the coastal strip and a number of the bores in that area, in, in, in that hind zone, uh, have problems with, with sand. And um, the way they deal with that is that the, 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 the drillers, when they're developing them, won't try and stress the bores too much. And they, so, so they, won't, um, they won't pump them at what, what could be their highest yield. And so the, the way they, that they um, carefully lead the well to higher production is to over time gradually increase the yield and that can be quite successful in in achieving a higher yielding bore in the end so to overcome that um, the plan is, uh, is 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 trying to do a great job in allowing people the ability to try and increase that rate over time and not have to 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 um, give away their surface water completely at the same time as they apply for the deep water, because we won't know what the yield is from the well at, at that early stage. Um, and I, I wasn't sure why there would be a need to, to add that seasonal volume part to, to, the, to the rule. Um, 
And uh, I got an example there uh, that, um, you know, if, if there was a surface water take, say it's 30 litres a second, had a seasonal volume of a uh, quarter of a million cubic metres a year, um, if the deep bore only produces 20 litres a second to start with, although, you know, with careful development, it's hoped that that will get up to 30 in time, it, in that example, it could be put that um, 20 litres a second is adequate to deliver the seasonal volume. It equates to 145 days of irrigation, so, so it's, feasibly, it's feasible that that could be argued that's, that the deep bore is sufficient to deliver the seasonal volume. Um, however, if you've only got the 20 litres a second, that may not be enough to run your irrigator, or certainly might not be enough to run it e e efficiently. And, you know, therefore, um, it, it doesn't seem appropriate to, to, um, to, to say that the, 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 the deep bore has to, um, or, 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 or can't, can't be, the, the yield from the bore can't be um, sufficient to deliver the seasonal volume. Otherwise, you might get some, some bizarre outcomes. So I've got a, um, you can see there I've got some suggested uh, wording which actually simplifies the conditions. So um, I probably don't need to go through that. Or would you like no. me to? No, good. Thank you. Okay. Just moving on uh, to the last rule, rule 13.530A. Um, this is a, a, a new rule that's been suggested by um, in the, in, by the officers, and it, it makes, if you don't meet conditions three or five of the previous rule, uh, it makes the activity a non-complying activity. And it was, um, well, I've, I've just felt it was extremely important that we explain the, the real need for, for that condition um, or even a slight revision of it. And, and that was because we've got a, what I think is a slightly bizarre position at the moment where we've got clients that have drilled deep bores, so they're trying to do the right thing. They, they hold surface water consents, they've drilled a deep bore um, to try and relinquish their surface water consent. They've done a constant rate aquifer test on that bore um, Unfortunately, after the test, they still needed, there were still some well interference issues with a couple of neighbours, so they needed to um, secure written approvals, and those written approvals were gained, um, but unfortunately, um, that was not accepted by Environment Canterbury, I guess quite rightly in, in some ways, because the way the plan is, is written, if, if you don't if the well interference doesn't meet the requirements of Schedule 12 of the plan, then it becomes a prohibited activity. And what the what to the council's um, interpretation was that if um, if you needed written approvals, you did not meet Schedule 12, and that meant that those applications were prohibited even though the, you know, the plan, the direction of the plan is trying to encourage people to go to deep bores and get off the surface water, I feel it was a bit of a technicality, really, that um, uh, these, some of the applicants were, were having problems. So the addition of this helps to overcome that, so I support that wholeheartedly. Um, I have made a little comment at the bottom that making it a, um, a non-complying activity, the, the bar... Uh, usually is, is still set at a pretty high level to get over for a non-complying activity. So I provided uh, a couple of options there as to, to, to how we might be able to um, uh, improve that situation uh, and, and, and make it not quite so difficult for people in that position that they, where they do need written approvals um, to gain their consent or to get through that, that part of the consent process. And that was either by just an, an, an advisory note um, or specifically saying in the plan that it has to meet Schedule 12 uh, or written approvals of affected bore owners were obtained. So, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bubb. We might have one or two questions to ask of you. Commissioner Van Voortisen? No, no questions, thank you. Commissioner Solomon? No, none from me either, thank you. Mr. Bubb, some people seem to think that they should be able to take groundwater as much as is there so as to meet their needs or wants for reliable irrigation. And I'm wondering whether the forest and bird request was perhaps trying to address in a modest way uh, a questioning of that kind of attitude. And, and perhaps I, I could put my understanding of it more this way. Should groundwater be treated as surface water might be, allow the taking only of so much as would not reduce the health of the water body and its ecosystems? Right, so, so just to paraphrase your question, so should the taking of groundwater be limited to prevent or limit the effects on ecosystems? Is that what you... Well, often in relation to groundwater takes, the, the focus is almost entirely on does it interfere with somebody, some other bore? Mm -hmm. As if there's a resource there that we can use the lot of, so long as we, we share it between one bore or another. And I'm not... I, I'm not sure that that's right, and I think that Forest and Bird might be questioning it. And I'm wanting to get your understanding okay. whether yeah. that's so. Is, the, is groundwater there to take, in terms of the RMA, as much as we can get? Uh, no, there are all, always other effects of taking groundwater. I think in, in, in this particular instance, though, we are... The, the rules dealing with taking deep groundwater, where we're actually swapping surface or shallow groundwater for deep groundwater, so that so the rule itself is is dealing with those effects. And so, when people are applying under this rule, they will be reducing some of the other effects, such as the you know effects on the surface water and the ecology. But what about the, the effects on the ecology of the groundwater? That um, these applications will only be be for um, allocation that's that's already well for water that's already been allocated to them. So um, you know those. Um, those questions presumably will have been considered within the um, setting of allocation limits in that zone. So these aren't applications for new water or additional water. It's simply swapping um, where they are taking that water from to a position um, where uh, allocation has been a set aside for them to do that within the plan. And in your experience, because this is your industry, not mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in your experience, are those things, in, in particular the ecology of the groundwater, considered in making the allocations in the first place? I don't think they have been in to the full extent, no. No. Mr. Bubb, thank you very much for coming in and giving us your uh, experience and your suggestions and, and proposals for how things might be improved. We do appreciate it. Great. Thanks indeed. Okay, thank you. I think that's all of our business today, so I'll adjourn the
hearing now until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock when we have the submission of as one incorporated 10 o'clock